Scale It Up Nation, most of us have on our to-do list to read more. But the fact of the matter is, we can only read a book when we are in the right place to read a book. And we are in our cars an awful lot. That's why Audible is such a powerful tool to make sure that you are staying up to date on the latest information, newest trends, and how to make your day-to-day better by having Audible read your books to you. Turn your car time into classroom time and get to reading all those books that you have on your list. Go to our affiliate link, scalinguph2o.com forward slash audible to get a free book and a free month so you can see why I've been using Audible for years. Welcome to the Scaling Up H2O podcast, the podcast where we scale up on our knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. My name is Trace Blackmore, and I get the distinct honor and privilege of hosting this amazing podcast. And why is it amazing? Well, it's not amazing because of the host. It is amazing because of all of you. And of course, we call people that listen to this podcast, the Scaling Up Nation, and you are the Scaling Up Nation. And the reason we did that is we wanted to emphasize that we have community. It's all about community. It's all about knowing that you are in an industry that so many other people are in. But sometimes that's difficult to think about when you are at your account, when you are driving from account to account, when you are thinking about an issue and you think that nobody else has ever experienced that issue. Or maybe you're trying to tell somebody about what your day-to-day job is and they just don't get it. Well, I know I am talking out of my own frame of reference and I'm sure that you have had similar items and feelings just like I have. And that's why we created the Scaling Up Nation, because when you do feel alone, you know you are not alone. Tens of thousands of water treaters are listening to this podcast right along with you, and we are all the Scaling Up Nation. And something that I think would even help grow the Scaling Up Nation is the next time somebody asks you what it is that you do, don't just explain the facts about the job. Explain the emotion about the job, why you love doing this job. And I think if we share more of that, people will start asking more questions. And when people start asking more questions, they get better answers. And who knows, we might talk to somebody that will just revolutionize this entire industry and make it better for all of us. So I ask that you go ahead and think about how awesome this job is and share it with the next person that asks you what you do for a living. Nation, one of the things that we get so many high praise comments with is the fact that the great team here at Scaling Up H2O is bringing everything that you need to know in the water treatment community to one central place. That one central place is scalinguph2o.com. And you can go over to pretty much any resource you want to research. What we try to do each and every week are bring you some of the items that are coming up that you may want to attend. And folks, I am really going to emphasize that when you go to conferences, when you go to meetups, whatever is happening within our industry, you are going to learn more than what you came into that conference or whatever it is that you arrived with. But not only are you going to learn more, you are going to know more people. And that is one of my favorite things within this industry is I have gotten the ability to meet so many new people that I would have never met before because I am involved in this industry. And let me tell you why that's so important. 
when you know other people in this industry, you're not alone anymore. And the knowledge that you went into that issue with is not the only knowledge that you have to troubleshoot with. You can call all the people that you know in this industry and you can ask them what they think. And folks, I cannot tell you how valuable that has been throughout my career, being able to lean on my friends within the water treatment community so I don't have to face issues alone. I don't have to start from square one. I can ask others what they have done. And then even if they have a solution, I get the opportunity to make it even better because they told me how they found it and how they left it. And now I get to start it all over again. We are in an amazing industry and getting to know all the people we can within this industry is how we make it even better. So many of us cannot travel because we are too busy. So maybe this next event is for you. The DeSalitix Water Week Online is taking place December 5th through 7th. This is an online conference. So if you can't travel because you are busy doing your day-to-day -day job, the DeSaltix Water Week is the premier virtual event that unites key players in the industrial and municipal water sector on a global scale. We'll have information about this conference for you on scalinguph2o.com under our event section. Another conference that you may be interested in that's taking place at exactly the same time. So maybe you can go to one in person and the other one virtually. Well, this one's taking place in Denver, Colorado. It's the North American Water Loss Conference and Expo. To find out information about that conference, we're going to have that on our events page. The 60th Annual Joint North Dakota Water Convention and Irrigation Workshop is taking place December 5th through 8th in Bismarck, North Dakota. So we're going to have information about that one as well on our events page. These are all taking place right on the exact same date. So you get the opportunity to figure out which one you are going to go to, or maybe you go to two and do the virtual one while you're at the other conference. Don't worry, we'll have all of that information for you and more on our events page. Something you want to mark your calendar for because we always have such a great time when we get together. Yes, I'm talking about the hang. Well, we've done all the hangs we are going to do this year. We do them once a quarter. And January 11th is the next time we are going to get together with the hang. The hang is where we get together, talk about all things water treatment, and just celebrate being in this industry. We get to meet new people and we get to have fun as we are doing it. So go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash hang to register and I look forward to seeing you there. The last event that I will mention is taking place in Chicago, Illinois, January 22nd through 24th, and that is the 2024 AHR Expo put on by ASHRAE and AHRI. This is a great show. If you've never been to it, there's so much to do there. It's one of the larger conferences that we get to attend. And we're going to have all the information you need to know on ScalingUpH2O.com on our events section. Talking about all of these conferences, it's really hard to go to a water conference these days and not hear about PFAS. PFAS is polyfluoroalkali substances, also called forever chemicals. And you have probably heard about these ad nauseum over the last couple of years. But before that, we never really heard about them. And as I started talking to more and more people, I realized that people heard the term, but they didn't really understand what that term meant. So we are going to have an interview for you today that is going to make sure you are in the know about this new acronym. My lab partner today is Tanya Chandler, Director at Biolargo, Global PFAS and Regulatory Expert. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you. 
Now, I'm trying to remember, you and I met years ago at a WefTech conference. Were you speaking then? Is that where we met? No, I was with probably Veolia at the time. And, uh, you know, I've been at WefTech now for 22 years, and I'll be there again this year. So if anybody uh, wants to talk to us, we're there. Well, speaking of WefTech and the International Water Conference, and you name the conference, you can't get an agenda of papers without PFAS being on the list of topics. So I thought we could start with basically just generally, if somebody hasn't heard of what PFAS is, what is PFAS? PFAS is per or polyfluorinated alkaline substances, which sounds like a lot of big words. Um, But it really boils down to they're the compounds that make plastic moldable or bendable. They are what makes compounds or what makes products greaseproof, what makes them waterproof. They are what helps us in the manufacturing process to help things slide evenly through manufacturing or to not clog or to not bind in the manufacturing process. They're emulsifiers, they're surfactants, so they're in a lot of our cleaners. They're in products you may not even know they're in, but the reality is they're everywhere. How did you become an expert in this topic? Well, I've always been uh, interested in it because it's an emerging compound for water and wastewater. And, you know, doing that, you know, 20 some years, you're always watching the latest trends. But when I came to work at BioLargo, BioLargo had started on an SBIR grant back in 2019. They had answered a call for innovation to remove PFAS from aqueous streams. So when I got here in the middle of COVID, One of the things that was my job to do was to dig a little bit more into PFAS. How are we going to market this product? Uh, What were the regulations surrounding this product? And it it kind of snowballed from there, where now I'm giving talks across the country on PFAS, everything from its history, the regulations, to best practices and how to treat it. But really, it has just been a kind of series of learnings that I have now fallen in love with. It's become a passion to me. And uh, realizing that as a kid, I might have been exposed to this where I lived. We're going to talk about exposure and, and where it is. where it is. Uh, in fact, there is an article I'm going to bring up in a second that a local newspaper just reached out to me about. But before we do that, I, I am kind of curious, when people come up to you and they, they want you to, to talk on this topic, I'm guessing there's two different streams of where these questions are coming from. One, I'm consuming these. What do I need to know? Two, I'm in charge of this for a customer. What do I need to know for regulatory? Or what do I need to know about my products to make sure that I'm not creating more of a problem down the road? Are, are those pretty much the, the two areas of questions that you're getting? Yeah, it's regulatory. And it's how the heck do we treat these as well? Um, I mean, that goes right along with the regulatory. But on the consuming side, the reality is, is we've been consuming these since, you know, 1945. Um, If you go back and look at the history of PFAS, although they say PTFE was developed in 1938 um, by Roy J. Plunkett, and he worked at DuPont, was a completely failed experiment, totally by accident. Really, if you go back and look for per and polyfluorinated compounds, you can actually find them in chemistry back in 1830, 1860. Um, And you can really attribute a lot of our modern technologies to the discovery of the uh, PFAS compounds. Things like we wouldn't have had the atomic bomb without PFAS. It played a big part in the seals and the linings as they were making the atomic bomb. But you can follow it through history and say that it became a consumer product in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, where we were starting to see it on pans. We were starting to see it in manufactured products. Another PFAS compound, the PFOS, which we know as Scotchgard, was another messed up experiment that 
turned into a product, you know, that was used for a long time. So it's really been entering our environment since the 40s and 50s. So we've been exposed to it longer than just this recent uh, regulatory, you know, insight on it. You can take it back through history. So is it necessary to treat it? Absolutely. Uh, We need to stop the cycle. But as far as limiting your consumption, you know, look for things that are, that say greaseproof, waterproof, things like that. Switch to a natural fabric softener um, because it's in fabric softener. It can be in detergent. So the more natural that you go, you'll reduce it. You won't eliminate it, but you'll reduce it. The article that I referred to earlier was about a local Atlanta municipality, and they found higher levels of PFAS. And that, of course, got everybody scared that had the drinking water in that municipality. And you and I spoke a little bit about this as we were, we were talking before recording the show. We've had this in our water for quite some time, but it's just now people are learning about it. And now they're starting to get worried about what they've been drinking for the past couple of years. So I'm curious, if a reporter called you and asked you what should the consumer be concerned about, how would you answer them? I guess I would be more worried about limiting my exposure outside of drinking water because municipally we're going to have to treat the drinking water. It's coming. We all know this. So that will take, you know, that will take care of it. If you've got the ability to put, you know, a carbon system, if you've got the ability to put a small uh, anion exchange system on, you know, your home unit, if you have your own well, you'll limit it quite a bit. The closer you are to things like manufacturing in airports is the, you know, more chances of your exposure through something like an impacted aquifer. But part of what uh, I tell people is, we're setting the levels very low because we're trying to break the cycles. But if you go over to Europe or if you ask who, World Health Organization, they're going to set the uh, limits at about uh, 100 parts per trillion, not four parts per trillion. So I don't worry about it as much in the drinking water because eventually we're, we're starting to break that cycle and your municipalities will have to take care of that. But I'm very conscious about what I buy because that's where a lot of your exposure is going to come from. We have in the United States stopped manufacturing products with PFOS and PFOA. We did that in the early 2000s, right? But we had never taken the steps for them coming in from overseas. We have now, as a government, taken that step and we removed the de minimis exemption on manufactured products coming in. Typically, you know, the regulations on importing of products has really focused around raw materials for things like the toxic release inventory and and all of that. We have now kind of broken that with PFAS and said if a product coming into the United States contains PFOS or PFOA, they have to list it on the label no matter how small the amount. Problem is, is a lot of people don't realize that what they're using to manufacture contains PFOS or PFOA, or it's created in the manufacturing process itself. When you talk about AFFF foam, AFFF foam is attributed to having PFOS and PFOA. PFOA is an added ingredient to that. PFOS is a byproduct made in the manufacturing of the foam. So Other things that we're putting in there are precursors and it's combining into and creating PFOS before it becomes the foam. So this is where we're still trying to kind of break down and see what's in, you know, what's in products and sometimes regulate the precursors that are creating those products. You mentioned point of use filters. Uh, Is just a regular carbon filter good enough? What should you be looking for if you're concerned about this? Okay, so there's studies that say that some of the pitcher carbon filters and the under the sink carbon filters can take out PFAS, and they probably are taking out some. But best practices on carbon filters are ion exchange systems. So carbon is 11 to 13 minutes of contact time to remove PFAS, and ion exchange is three to five. 
Now, will it take out some? Absolutely. It won't probably take out all and small chain PFAS are going to go right through it. NSF has a rating, I believe it's 53. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, a little bit. If somebody got a filter that had that rating, should they say, yes, I don't have to worry about this anymore? Uh, No, I I still think you're (laughs) going to see PFAS go through it. It, It's hard to escape 100%. 100%. It's in the rainwater. It's in the grass. It's in the food we eat. You know, it's in the air we breathe. So you can minimize your exposure, but you're not going to eliminate it. They've found PFAS three three feet deep in the Arctic. They found it on the top of Mount Everest and they found it in the rainforest. So it travels. It follows the water cycle and it travels. So you're not going to escape it completely. You know, the farmers can do their best to, you know, not have it in the water that they're pulling up for irrigation, but you're still going to see it in the rainwater coming down. You know, we, we, it's not like we can put canopies over everything. Let's change gears slightly and talk about industrial. So now we've got a customer that's trying to remove it in their system. So now we're talking about wastewater. What are some of the methods that are being employed there? So the first thing is if you find that you've got uh, PFAS contamination or if you test positive on the wastewater side, make sure you're using method 1633 in the analysis that is designed for wastewater. And it's going to test for, I think it's 29 PFAS compounds. If you happen to get a positive result, first, foremost, take a look at your testing itself. Walk yourself backwards and say, did I use nitrile gloves that contain powder? What was I wearing at the time? Did I have sunscreen on? Did I have skin lotion on? What products did I have on? Did I basically, did I contaminate my sample? Because the fact of the matter is if you're wearing a shirt that's got a fabric softener on it and it happens to shed a few fibers, it doesn't take much to create that part per trillion positive result. Another thing is, did I put it in a Ziploc bag? Did I use a post-it note on the top of it? Ziploc bags don't contain PFAS, but PFAS are used in the manufacturing of them. Same thing with post-it note. The glue on the post-it note contains PFAS. So that's the first thing. Walk back through your process and say, do I have a cleaning solution? Do I have some kind of manufacturing aid that contains it. If it, if you do, look at switching. If if it's vital to your process, then you have to treat on the backside. Then you have to look at what's my flow rate. What other contaminants do I have in the water? Reason being, waste, backside of a wastewater plant, carbon and ion exchange. If you've got high organics coming out, are going to go. You know, you're going to burn them up way too fast. And you don't want to have to take that wastewater to a tertiary output point because you're going to add, you know, millions of dollars in overall capital and operating cost. So do I need to look at a technology that's more suited on the wastewater side than the traditional technologies tend to be? So then you look at more of the innovative technologies. And so you're looking at flow rate because you can look at something like a foam fractionation system. But you really got to have a decent flow rate for that um, because you're going to a supercritical water oxidation destruction behind it. And you're talking very capital intensive processing there. Do I go to something like an aqueous electrostatic concentration unit? It's still a collection process, but, you know, it's I can say it's made by my company but we follow it with a destruction process. So you're still getting the destruction. You don't want to trade one problem for the next. So whatever you do on the backside, you want to make sure that you know what the consumables are and what kind of product you're going to have to dispose on the backside of it. February of 2024 is the date we are expecting to find a rule published for CERCLA. CERCLA. So what does that mean? Yes, CERCLA is closed sites. But when something gets put on a hazardous constituents list for CERCLA, three things have to happen. One, if you have a release of more than uh, one pound in a 24-hour period, you have to report it as a toxic release. 
it must be reported in any kind of real estate transfer, especially government real estate, but it's already worked its way into the ASTM phase one site evaluations. So you're already starting to see the PFAS clause there. So that's two. The third one is the bigger deal. The third one requires it to be registered with the Department of Transportation as hazardous waste to transport. That means if you're transporting carbon, you're transporting media from an ion exchange system, all of that media now has to be transported as has waste. You're also going to start seeing RECRA, that we're expecting the first uh, rule for RECRA, the initial rule, to be published in December. So that's going to be active sites. And again, it's going on the Appendix 8, so it's a hazardous constituent. It's not, it's a hazardous substance. It's not full has waste, but it will be treated as such. But because it's looking at both of those rules, now you're talking cradle to grave. So if you don't go to a full destruction process at the end, and not the destruction process that cleaves off the functional end and says it's a it's destroyed it, but it's now just made it into a small, you know, a short chain, the full to inert salt destruction process, you are now responsible for it, whatever happens to it. And CERCLA has no time frame that you can go back 50 years to uh, find somebody under the polluters pay rules. So make sure you know what you're going to do with it. Make sure you're not going to trade one thing for another. If you do have clean water, you're going to a carbon system. Do you have high silica? Do you have high nitrate? Uh, Do you have high organic? Same with ion exchange. These are the things that are going to interfere with the system. You have to worry about channeling with those systems. So make sure that, you know, you know how to handle it. The big thing is get a consultant involved that understands your process as well as the wastewater process itself. Well, let's stay on the regulatory goal for a while. You, you mentioned that and, and you mentioned you mentioned a lot of numbers before. What are you seeing in municipalities? Because if we see it in one area, we're probably going to see it follow suit in other areas. What do we need to look for? Okay, the EPA published its notice of rulemaking for safe drinking water. And they came out with four parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS. And then they came out with a hazard index for other PFAS. The hazard index is really a calculation about exposure. It's based on the idea that if somebody drank two and a half liters of water a day for a specific amount of time, I'd have to look up what that is, that 30% of their exposure is going to come from their drinking water. So you take a running average of the last four quarters and you'd say, okay, my Gen X number, I divide that by 10 and my PFBS number and I divide that by 2000 and my PFNA number, I divide that by nine and my PFHXS, I divide that by 10, might have those two backwards and you add it all up and it has to equal one or less. If you're over one, you are over the limit, which a lot of people have given criticisms about because if you are off in one of those, you're going to push yourself over for all of them. So they're, they're, there's still a question on whether they'll keep that like that, but we're supposed to see the next iteration of that rule in December. We're also supposed to see uh, Clean Water Act numbers in December, the first iteration of what those are going to look like, including what NP, you know, the NEPS permits, the NPDES permits are going to look like. They put it into the monitoring. Now you're going to see them actually put some numbers to it and and give us some numbers that we may have to hit. You're also seeing Plan 15 on the landfill side. Um, Anybody doing their own landfill work. If you discharge to a navigable waterway, they're telling you that the numbers are coming out soon. Um, And then they ordered a study done on leachate that's going into the POTW systems, the municipal systems, so they can actually start putting numbers around those. The kicker to all of that is once you put something on CERCLA, once you put something on RECRA, you can't dispose of a hazardous constituent in a navigable waterway without specialized permitting. 
So it jump starts the whole process. That means you cannot put RO concentrate down a sewer without a specialized permit if you have because you can't discharge into a you can't discharge a hazardous substance into a sewer. So it really pushes all of these other regulatory factors forward. Now, EPA has said they're not going after municipalities. They've said they're going after industrial clients first on CERCLA. They are going to look at where has the most contamination come from. They're going to map systems. They're going to walk it back, and they're going for those enforcements first. At least that's what they've indicated. You go to the store, you buy coffee, and the coffee's certified to be safe, and the rainforest is nice and healthy. Is there a certification that there's no PFAS in the making of the product? There's been a lot lot of lawsuits around it. Burt's Bees, uh, Orville Redenbacher, Coca-Cola, Maybelline, All May, uh, Nick's Underwear, Burger King, McDonald's, all of these companies have been sued. Uh, in one sh- way, shape, or form, Capri Sun, the Simply Juices, they've been sued for saying they're 100% natural or that they are sustainable, and then PFAS has been found. There was a ruling not too long ago for Orville Redenbacher that said they can't be liable for unintentionally added PFAS. So that's a big win for the manufacturing industry, especially the food manufacturing industry. So that if it's coming in as a byproduct of, okay, the oranges were watered by, you know, watered the trees, the trees uptake the water, you know, it goes into the oranges, you're not liable for the PFAS that are in the oranges um, because it came from rainwater. All of this stuff is just one way we're seeing the regulatory framework come about. But let's be honest, we know that some of that regulatory framework will come from precedent set in lawsuits. What does that landscape look like? Have there been lots of PFAS lawsuits? There has. Uh, So right now, there's a multi-district litigation lawsuit surrounding impacted municipalities from AFFF foam. That they've somewhat, everybody kind of probably has heard about that at DuPont 3M. They're coming to a conclusion of that now, and that lawsuit actually takes a phased approach on how it pays out, but it'll set a precedent. There's other lawsuits going on for manufacturers. There's other lawsuits going on for personal injury. So you're starting to see this landscape, and and there's been a steady increase of PFAS lawsuits since about 2019. What are some of the most common misconceptions around this topic? That we're going to be able to uh, solve all of our problems with uh, GAC and ion exchange. Really, that is the misconception, and it's not because they don't work. They, I will never tell you they don't work. They do. And they are very good technologies for removing it. But there isn't enough carbon in the world to remove all of the PFAS. We couldn't produce enough granular activated carbon to put on every wastewater system, every drinking water system in the country and change it out at the frequency it's going to require. We are going to have to look to innovations for biosolids. I always tell people if you had to pick a, they ask me if you had to pick a treatment for biosolids, my instant answer is supercritical water oxidation if you can afford it. Because it is one of the better technologies. HALT Systems, again, are another one, same concept, a little bit lower temperature and pressure. But they both take the biosolids through a process where they're salting out, as they call it, the PFAS, making it into inert salts. But it needs to be, it's high energy consumption, it is high pressures, high temperatures, and there's a lot of chemistry that has to be monitored. So it's not for the average municipality. It's not for the average business. I tell people, get a good collection process and then send it to somebody else for disposal if you are a small company. If you are, you know, or look for somebody that's got a service exchange program that'll take that liability on them um, instead of being on you. You know, BioLargo Water, we're one that does a service exchange. 
uh, Culligan does a service exchange, that eliminates some of the liability of the regulations that are coming because you don't actually own the media. You're basically renting it. So as an industrial water treater, and we've got lots of industrial water treaters listening today, what's the bare minimum that they need to arm themselves around this topic so when their customers ask them about it, they can start with good information? Well, one of the thing is, as a manufacturer, you know, some of the labeling that's coming out on the products that people are going to be uh, looking for are things like free of uh, intentionally added PFAS. You know, you can arm yourself with your customers on we are doing everything that we can to keep unintentionally added PFAS out of our product or intentionally added PFAS out of our product. But on the wastewater side, be able to know what you have in your product, what you have in the making of your product. Ask for ingredients lists. Ask the manufacturers of the chemicals you use in the manufacturing process, do you have PFAS compounds in your product? Because they'll have to go back and find out. But things like Teflon seals in you know machinery, that's PFAS. Can you switch to silicone? Can you, you know, it, it's things like that. But then arm yourself, do your testing and arm yourself with what you do have. Because all of your permitting, all of the, uh, you know, as the municipalities map back, if you go to a POTW and are required to do pretreatment, it's better to be proactive and say, I'm removing this already, rather than them come back and put an edict on you that says you have to treat it. You know, be proactive on it and work with the municipality to get it out rather than being the one that they can point a finger to. But those systems take maintenance. And that's the other thing you need to know. Pick a system that has the maintenance for the personnel and the operator hours that you have, because none of these are set it and forget it systems. Not when you're talking PFAS, because even a carbon system, even an ion exchange system, although there's not a lot of work to them, there is a lot of testing that has to be done on the backside because they channel. And the minute you channel, you now have an untreated stream going through and the AWWA and the EPA has said they don't want you backwashing or uh, fluffing on site. The other thing is if your process uses mixed bed treatment already, you're already taking PFAS out because it's going to the anion of the mixed bed. So if you're doing any kind of anion treatment, if you've got an RO in your system, if you're already using GAC, you're already taking it out. So then your options are on the front side of things, you can put a system in that'll capture it before it goes into those processes or you let those processes uh, take it and then deal with the media disposal after or you know, make sure you're doing a lot of testing on it. For a member of the Scaling Up Nation that wants to learn more about this topic, are there particular resources that you like to recommend people to? Well, I always recommend that people go to my website, which is bestpfostreatment.com. But you can also go to local seminars. Uh, you can go to the AWWA website. Um, they have a lot. EPA has a lot of information. But if you're looking for something that's a little less dry, <laughs> one of my favorite books on the topic is called Exposure. And it's the story of the first lawsuit. Um, by Robert Billet on behalf of Wilbur Tennant against DuPont. But there's a lot of background PFAS information on that. You can watch the movie Dark Waters. That is actually a really good resource. It's a docudrama. They took a few liberties, but it's pretty accurate. Or if you, want, if you like documentaries, go out to YouTube and find The Devil We Know, which is a documentary on the Parkersburg lawsuit. I will make sure to have all of those resources on the show notes page. We've talked about some technologies already. You mentioned there were some more innovative ones. I know you've been personally involved with, with several. Can you tell us about those? Okay. So obviously my favorite is mine, which is called the aqueous electrostatic concentrator. And my reason for it being my favorite actually is more about the technology's flexibility. 
because it works on water, it works on wastewater, it'll work on leachate. So it's not impeded by some of the factors that impede some of the other units. But there is no black box in water treatment. We all know that. There just isn't. It's all based on chemistry. So when you're looking for treatment, look for companies that are willing to test the product first. Look for a company that's willing to do a small pilot. I tend to shy away right now from bioremediation, not because bioremediation doesn't work, but because nobody's proven out a bug yet that will eat PFAS. They're working on it. They're close, but bugs don't eat anything they can't expel the energy from. So, you know, we might be waiting a little bit for some genetic modification there. I mentioned the supercritical water oxidation. That is good if you have high concentrations of carbon. Plasma and photovitalic technologies are very high energy intensive, so they tend to be more on the expensive side. They work better on PFOAs than they are going to be on PFOS. Anytime you're looking at PFAS treatment, know what PFAS you have. Because if you've got more long chain PFAS, some, if you see PFOS, PFOA come up, PFNA in your testing, then traditional treatments probably will work pretty good for you. The carbon, the ion exchange. If you come up with what they call short chain PFAS, if you see more of the Gen Xs come up, they're going to be harder to take out. So you're going to be looking more towards those innovative treatments that use something to enhance the polarity of the PFAS and use it against itself because they tend to go right through. They're small. They don't have as big of a uh, polarity to attach to the ion exchange. Um, so a carbon will come along and they it'll knock it right off. It'll go right through the you know the the carbon systems. So when you're talking with short chain PFAS, you really need to look at technologies that are more on the electrochemical side, more on the uh, electrostatic concentration side, that are going to have a electrolytic field that is going to pull the PFAS towards it. Well, this has been a great wealth of information. I'm sure there are people out there that still have some questions. If someone wanted to contact you directly, how could they do that? Well, they can reach out to me at PFAS at biolargo.com or tanya.chandler at biolargo.com. If you go to that bestpfostreatment.com website, uh, there is a more information button. It comes directly to my email at, as well. So please feel free to reach out. Well, I'm not quite done with my questions yet. We're going to shift gears to the lightning round question. So are you buckled up? I am. All right. My first question, if you could go back in time and talk to your former self on your very first day as a PFOS expert, what advice would you give yourself? Follow your passion. Throw yourself into it. Follow your passion. Because if you do it that way, sky's the limit on what you can do. I always wanted to give talks about this kind of stuff and, and really dig into it. And by doing that, by following the passion um, and getting myself out there, I've been able to do that. Speaking of that, you have put out so much great content on this topic. I want to make sure that we have some links on our show notes page so people can easily find that. Uh, it, it really is brilliant work that you've done. I want to thank you for that personally. Thank you. Next question. What are some of the books that you're reading? Okay, so um, I tend to be, I don't know if it's a knowledge sponge or, or very boring, but some of the books I've been reading obviously is Exposure by Robert Billet. That one I actually have read multiple times. But then as I was thinking about this, I Plastic and Autobiography and uh, Oppenheimer and the Atomic Bomb. I saw the movie Oppenheimer and uh, knowing the connection between the role PFAS played in the making of the atomic bomb um, and then seeing that movie, it, it really has had me digging into the history of that. So, Do they mention the seals in the book or the movie? In the book, yes. In the movie, no. And believe it or not, that plastic and autobiography has a quote from the president of DuPont in the beginning of it. And it said, after the war, 
which was referring to after the military wasn't buying the um, Teflon anymore. And he goes, we need to make sure that the American public is never satisfied. Obviously, they're going to make a movie about your life. Who do you want playing Tanya? Elizabeth Olsen. There you go. My last question, you now have the power to talk to anybody throughout history. Who would it be with and why? Um, that one's a, a little bit harder for me um, because there's so many great people in history that I could go through. But I think I'd like to talk with Einstein. I saw some commercial the other day. Somebody was playing cards with Einstein. So I don't know. Maybe maybe you'll play cards with him someday. It's either Einstein or, uh, or Oppenheimer because you look at the way that their brain works. And it's. I think it would be interesting to sit down and see what their opinion on all of this would be. I've read several things on Einstein, and he did not waste any energy on anything that shouldn't require thought. He wore the same thing every day, ate the same thing, the same times. He just wanted to involve his brain with thinking of the next new thing, not the next thing. Tanya, thank you so much for joining us on the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Thank you for having me. Scale Up Nation, I want to make sure that whenever you are out there and there is a piece of information that you want to learn more about, you let the Scaling Up H2O website know about that. And you, of course, punch in scalinguph2o.com and go to our ideas page. And that's what somebody did for this very topic. We found an expert, and I hope for the people that wrote in that you are satisfied that we found an amazing expert to talk about your question. Now, don't leave it just to them because we've already aired this show. So we need a show to replace it. So what is it that you want to hear about? Who is it that you want to hear from? And don't keep that information to yourself. Make sure you go to scalinguph2o.com, go over to our ideas page and let us know what that piece of information is. And that will not only get your question answered, get your guest on the show, it will help us in our quest to make sure we have a brand new show for you each and every Friday. And Nation, I have to tell you that I am doing a victory lap today because one of the things that I was looking so forward to was being the keynote speaker at the International Water Conference, and I got that privilege earlier this week. It was so much fun. I was able to meet so many people within the Scaling Up Nation, and I have no doubt that we have hundreds of new Scaling Up H2O Nation members to listen to the podcast each and every week by going to the International Water Conference. Now, the one of the reasons I say that is I am just delighted that I got the opportunity to be the keynote speaker for the International Water Conference, but I also learned that there's a lot of people out there that have never heard of this podcast. So you can help me get the word out about this podcast and make sure when you ever connect with somebody within the water sector, you let them know about scaling up H2O. One of my friends that is always talking about our podcast and anybody who can listen, he is helping them subscribe to Scaling Up H2O. Well, of course, that's my friend James McDonald. And here's a brand new periodic water table with James. Hello and welcome to the periodic water table with James where we think and learn about water chemistry drop by drop. Please use your week to search online, ask your colleagues, or even pick up a book to learn more about each week's periodic water table topic. If you do, at the end of the year, you'll be 52 water chemistry smarter. So let's raise the water table of knowledge together and get started. Today's topic is... Diethylaminoethanol, or DEAE, or even DEEA to some. Its molecular formula is C6H15NO. What is DEAE used for in water treatment? 
What is its neutralizing capacity? What is a distribution ratio? And what is DEAE's distribution ratio? How does this compare to morpholine or cyclohexylamine? What does the distance from the feed point have to do with selecting DEAE as a best fit? Are feed limitations placed upon DEAE when used in food production and humidification? If so, what are they? Is DEAE blended with anything else? Why? Remember, knowledge is power, and taking the time to learn more about water chemistry each week will help make you a force to be reckoned with. Be sure to post what you learn to social media and tag it with hashtag watertable23 and hashtag scalingupH2O. I look forward to learning more from you. Thank you, James, and thank you, Scaling Up Nation. We're going to have a brand new episode for you next week. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of the water, and make sure you tune in next week. Have a great week, folks. Scout Nation, when I teach the Association of Water Technologies technical training class, people always come up to me asking questions about the mock exam. Now, maybe you haven't signed up for the Certified Water Technologist designation yet, and if you're in the same field that I am, why haven't you? Go ahead and sign up. Get your certification. Make sure that you are making this industry better, and you can do that by getting certified. Need a little bit of extra help building your confidence? We built a class that you can enroll in today, helping you go through each and every one of the 75 mock questions. So if you want a little extra boost, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep. Once again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep to enroll today.